Home is not just where you lay your hat, it is where you keep your secrets. The money under the mattress, the gun in the coffee pot, the drawer bedside your bed. Mankind had many secrets. In the greater galaxy, these remained unknown. None ever made it to the new neighbors that humankind now shared space with. When war clouds began gathering in the stars, mankind took the money, pulled the gun, and stole the batteries. Secrets are kept for a reason. Man's bloody history of genocide and extinction were best kept at home. If anyone really needed to know what happened to the elephant or Australia, best have a wide smile and no idea. Terran UNRC, Geneva, Swiss Italian Protectorate, General Secretary, Official Address. Honored members, we face a choice. Things long hidden will need to be brought into the light. Despite our reputation as peacemakers, we recognize a threat. The CJEC are xenophobic empire builders. They despise our diplomatic efforts. We recognize this behavior. It was us, once. Our friends refuse to acknowledge this. They are unfamiliar with the very concept. They will lose. You cannot make peace with someone who seeks only war. We have failed to convince our allies. Now you will vote. Does humanity go to war? Do we expose ourselves? This is a decision for all. By secret ballot, you will decide humanity's future. Please vote now. Ghosts of genocide and stolen gold, of slavery and religion, of the unforgiving heat and slow murder. Everything mankind had endured, everything mankind recognized always a little too late. Not today. For the first time since entering the galactic community, mankind chose war. The real test came soon. Earth announced they would support any independent world, that the human fleets would respond to aggression that the human government would impose sanctions against any that sought to invade its neighbors. Pax Humanitas was born. On Earth, conscription was revived. In space, military spending and expansion turned the system into a war machine. The colonies were squeezed for resources. Tax and technology pushed ahead. The first Cyjek fleet was intercepted in the middle of attacking a small Homner mining colony. A small human patrol intervened. Sijek fleet, cease fire. This world is prohibited to you. Return to your base. The Sijek fleet wrecked the patrol, the first human dead. In the reports released to the galaxy, they were heroic defenders of the weak, lost to the evil that attacked without warning. The reality was that they were the canaries in the coal mine, and they spent their last minutes choking on vacuum. The press releases had been ready for months just waiting for the names. Then the Sijek wiped out the Homner colony. They were still landing on the planet when Earth Response Fleet 1 arrived. Attention, Sijek fleet. Surrender or die. You have declared war today. The Sijek commander was expecting a challenge. Faithless fools fallen far from the gods. This was a killing time. The very sons declared it. Finally, he could move openly against the humans. His translator moved to help. The commander waved him away. He had been forced to live among the human mess before, allowing the weak to live, refusing to hunt, polluted scum. Human fleet, weak herbivores, we will eat you, he opened fire. His ships favored plasma weapons with enough EMP and missile fire to keep it interesting. The ERF unveiled humanity's darkest secret, that they had never stopped building the better gun, the better poison, the better soldier. Hidden until today was the pointy bit of mankind, the sharp end. The ERF made the call that all of Earth had been waiting for. A patrol could be explained away. Attacking the first fleet? You are as fucked as humanly possible. The Sijek commander had never faced true enemies. Herbivores, ascended, civilians all. They didn't understand the glory of war. He yearned for the true battle. The humans hid their past, but you could read it in their faces. The eyes, the teeth, the clenched fist in the face of casual aggression. They fooled those who wished to be fooled, not the Sijek. He knew that he too was expendable. He was the torch to set the galaxy on fire, and it only cost him his life, dying in battle. A wish fulfilled. Humans, go home. Wait until we eat your world. Fire. There were 60 ships in the Sijek fleet. None of them had ever seen a photon fractal missile. No one had, that was sort of the point. They went completely untracked until they struck home. The ERF vaporized the enemy. Nothing was left in this universe anyway. 
the First Fleet began landing a mix of Marines and first responders on the planet. Response Marines, gear up, we drop in three. Then the galaxy realized this wasn't some play for political points. Humans really meant it. The Response Marines dropped into mankind's first land battle in 60 years. Corporal Hinckley wished she could take a piss. She hated heights. Deep breaths, deep breaths. Everyone good to go? Her squad nodded, combat suits muted. The insertion pods flew through the atmosphere, a battle between combat programming and the enemy's software. Earth won. They began landing on the outskirts of the main Homner colony. The landing was now unopposed. The city lay burning in front of her. Move up, we wait on the scout's intel. Find cover, keep the noise down, go! The sergeant started calling orders. Left of the drop, cover for 40 meters. Building on the right, mortars ASAP. Hinkley following, take your squad in. In 10, go! Hinkley's squad followed their drones in, combat suits at full capacity. They had profiles of all the known Sijak weapons, time to see if intel was right. The briefing had been short and sweet. They are wolves, pack hunters with a war religion, excellent fighters, lousy thinkers. You're never facing just one of them. If you can see them, it's because they want you to. They have limited patience. Use that. Draw them out. Leave your injured visible. It sucks. But unless you want to spend your very brief time saving everyone, then this is what works. Bait. That's what we are. We will kill them as they think they are winning. In the many reports written afterwards, it was this that defined the war. Pack aggression, backed by a battle religion against a persistence predator with the ethics of a drug-addled alley cat. Humanity viewed war as the lowest form of endeavor, the resort of the deluded. They had seen so much of it in the past that they know its true cost. They also knew that only unconditional industrialized war was the correct response. Unfortunately, this left their soldiers as nothing but units, no longer people. Give them the tech. Give them the resources. Pity them. Failure is not an option. Mankind is an ugly place sometimes, and nowhere is uglier than a battlefield. Hinkley recovered her men. Fuck using them as bait. They moved faster than the enemy, provoking them to attack and then falling back to the choke points she had chosen. She reckoned they were ahead on points. She had led her people carefully through the town, nothing but corpses. She didn't know the Homner, but, given the size disparity, the dead included children. Command established a bunker on a convenient site close to the city. Every ranking officer was there, calling the shots. Around them, the ground troops moved to engage, sending back drone footage and taking orders. They should have checked why the site was undefended. The first breach came through the floor. The pressure of the explosion was enough to send the doors 40 meters into the air. Then the Sijek forces moved in. It was quickly over. Hinkley ghosted through the town. Comms had gone quiet, leaving only the sound of flames and the occasional falling wall. The Sijek had wiped out everyone. The smell felt like it was glued to her. Finally, they approached decent ground. Get the claymores in place. We fall back to the tree line. Everyone is a sniper today. Get your shit together. Pick them off as they approach. One of her men made his way back to her. Corporal, the sergeant is down for good. Comms are fucked. You're the boss now. Like I said, back to the tree line. Ambush these fuckers. Move! The Sejek troops were getting increasingly frustrated. They had pushed the humans back at a heavy price, then the humans reformed out of range. Ground was recovered. But for what? The humans were leading his troops by the nose, and he couldn't do a thing about it. Finally, the humans broke, running for the trees. His men had killed the officer in charge. Hinkley waited for the attack. Her men were in the trees. They had outlasted the fuckers. They were becoming increasingly erratic. Welcome to her war. The Sijek troops hit every mine, IED, and tripwire laid down. Idiots thought this was a glorious charge. Hinkley's men just kept shooting from cover. Afterwards, she walked through the battlefield and used her sidearm to shut the fuckers up. They didn't take prisoners, so she saw no reason to either. Corporal Hinkley to comms. Now. Welcome back, command. Long time no here. Shut up and listen. This is Fleet Command. We have lost the stream from command and control, Corporal. You are now an acting sergeant. If you could find your captain, that would be helpful. Now for the bad news. In the system, the ERF were studying the debris. Then the alarms kicked off. The main Sijek battle fleet was on the way. They had been powered down in a nearby system. 
All mankind supposed intel was garbage. Even with the new weapons, this was too much. Choices needed to be made. The first fleet began deploying AI attack drones into the system. They faced odds of 10 to 1. Obviously, this whole attack was carefully designed to end in an overwhelming Sijek victory. Attention, Marine Command. We need to withdraw from the system. Your men need to take cover until we are reinforced. We do not have time for recovery. The main Sijek battle fleet is entering the system. Hinkley went back to her men. She called all the corporals together. They can't find the captain. It's just me for now. The fleet is pulling out of the system. Shit just went sideways. We're looking at reinforcements for the bad guys and orbital bombardment from their main battle fleet. The troops were not particularly impressed. One of the corporals was blunt. They fucked up, and I get to tell the men they are already dead. Nice. We are a whole fucking bunch of medals waiting to happen. Hinkley silently agreed. However, her job was to keep these fuckers alive. Sure, it sucks. Intel was wrong. Surprise. This is a mining colony. Get your men and supplies. We're going underground for a while. The mine head is less than a click from here. Pick up your shit and get moving. Tell your friends we'll throw a party. Word went out to the response marines. No one quite sure who gave the order. Other sergeants were just glad to have an order or at least a destination. Neither the fleet or the men yet knew that the command post had been wiped out while Hinckley was still shooting from the tree line. She set up a post at the top of the mine. Her men had grabbed every map, computer, and sign in the place. She had no idea how deep she needed to go, but she started by sending her supplies to the bottom. Over two clicks down, her men were using full stealth on their suits for now. Sarge, new arrivals, someone is unhappy. At the post stood a sergeant. Yep, he seemed unhappy. Hinkley had been waiting for this. Yes, sergeant, what can I do for you? Who the fuck are you, corporal? Why are you ordering people around exactly? Hinkley smiled. Not a corporal. A sergeant, according to Fleet, just like you. I just haven't had time to put my makeup on. But this is my base. My orders or go find the captain. Or your own mine. The man stood there, trapped by circumstances. There was only one mine on the fucking planet. Without a captain, the sergeant of the base had command. Even if she still wore corporal stripes, his men had already decided and were pushing past to get underground. Hinkley scoured the incoming troops for engineers. She had plenty of blood and balls to spare, but she needed brains. She assembled her newly appointed engineers. I need to seal this place up. We need atmosphere, water, energy, and food in that order, in the dark. If they see us, we are dead. Here's what we have to work with. Give me a plan. The Sejek fleet is about to start shooting, so make it fast. Terran UNRC. Our fleet has been forced to retreat. The Marines are presumed dead. We will reinforce the first fleet and counterattack. They obviously planned this well. Our victory will be all the sweeter when we destroy their battle fleet. Send our thoughts and prayers to the families of the Marines. Make sure they all get medals. Minehead, Week 1 Hinkley picked a handful of men and sent them out to grab any supplies they could find. She sent the sappers out to plant surveillance equipment around the minehead. Comms was reduced to a passive signal to guide in the last stragglers. When it became clear no one else was coming, she ordered it shut down. She sent the drones to map the mine and take a head count. It came back as 627. That meant around 400 missing or dead. More than she expected, less than she hoped. Tell the sergeants I want a meeting. Send them to Vault 1. There were 30 men waiting for her. Vault 1 had been a staging area for the miners. It led to the mine shafts and dormitories. The canteen was right beside it, as well as medical. First up, the chain of command. Normally we would have a few officers around. Not today. They are on the missing or dead list at the moment. I'll let you know if one turns up. Military law puts me in charge. I don't get a choice and neither do you. However, I'm not an idiot. We meet here and we plan. We try to stay alive and keep the men busy and breathing. I need medics. I need cooks. I need a list of every specialist you have. I also need you to collect every MRE that your men have. We are on rations until resupply. I need one of you to take charge of food. Our engineers have a plan. The discussion went on for hours as the men got familiar with each other. The reality was clear to them all. This was a last stand situation. 
Hinckley seemed to have a grip on things and no one else wanted the job anyway. One of the sergeants approached her towards the end. Sarge, my name is Elysium. I'm a doctor. You said you needed medics? Hinckley looked at the man. He was the size of the proverbial brick shithouse. He looked like someone had decided it would be fun if the artillery could walk around. You're a doctor? Then you're a captain by default. You want to take over this shit show? I was a captain. I lost that rank following a discussion about medical ethics with a major. He healed up quite quickly. I believe he's back walking now. Are we going to be having that kind of discussion because I heal really slowly? Elysium smiled. Not unless you decide to use lower-ranking soldiers as your personal punching bag. I got tired of repairing the damage. Hinkley waved to the left. The medical center is over there. All yours, Sergeant. Keep me updated. Sergeant Elysium walked off, ready to take on the world to keep the men alive. The first days were a scramble as the men found bunks. Then they began to find their way around the mine complex. Some sergeants had staked out areas for training. Another had begun building an armory. The medical center reported successful treatment for those injured on the way in. The Sijek were searching the planet. They found many bodies, a few stranded humans that were quickly executed. But the human forces were gone. This was impossible. The whole plan had been to drive out their fleet and wipe out the trapped troops. They wanted images of the humans being fed to the men, hunted across the planet, humiliated. Minehead, week two. Hinkley was keeping the first 500 meters down empty. She didn't want anyone hearing things they shouldn't. The sappers had set up passive sensors and sealed the entrance. Four squads stood ready to respond if someone came by. Sergeant Elysium had a novel solution to the potential food shortage. He had used the med lab to grow an utterly foul bacterial loaf. The thing never stopped growing, provided it was supplied with water. It tasted like bread that had been sitting in a damp room for a couple of weeks. He insisted that it would provide enough nutrition to keep an adult alive indefinitely. Why they would want to live after tasting it remained a question. Nevertheless, it could feed the men. Perhaps mixing it with the MREs would work. Some unfortunate test subject had named it dwarf bread. Water was simple. They were well below the water table. As usual in a mine, the problem was too much water. They had left the pumps running. Unless you attack it, that was the sort of technology that never died. No one would think it strange. The orbital fleet overhead had begun pounding the town. Any building that might harbor humans was being destroyed. The men listened to the sounds as they played cards. Hinkley had set up a rough office in Vault 1, handy for catching people on the way pretty much anywhere. Her calm sat quietly beside her, telling her exactly nothing. Everything was numbers. How much food? How many mouths? How much ammo? How long they had been here? A stream of sergeants and men stopped by, looking for things, looking for something to do, looking for hope. She had put a lot of them to work on building the maze, a lot of make work, filling in unwanted corridors and constructing choke points, making the men tired enough to sleep. No one said the obvious, that fighting downwards in the depths of the mine was a one-way trip. Minehead Week 3 Hinkley stared at the roof. The heat exchanger in the corner was humming away. She pulled herself out of the bunk, heading for the last cup of coffee she would ever have, probably. One last cup for everyone. The canteen was crowded. Everyone seemed to want to mark the day. Then the men formed up, leaving a corridor for her to reach the counter. One cup of coffee sat there, beside a row of upturned mugs. She didn't understand what was going on. Too early. For some reason, Sergeant Elysium was behind the counter. Sergeant? The question in her voice was evident. The men would prefer you stay awake. They have given you their last cup of coffee and something else. He looked past her. She turned to see a phalanx of sergeants approach. Sergeant Hinckley, by the eternal and ineffable power of the NCO, we appoint you Captain of Minehead. Two sergeants stepped forward and pinned stars to her uniform. At that, the sergeant saluted. The men stood to attention. Sergeant Elysium leaned over, perhaps a few words. She picked up the coffee and took a deep drink. Then she addressed them, at ease. When I was dragged into this army, they said I would see exotic places, that I could be a field marshal. 
Now I see it was all true. Here we are in a place I would never have seen without the army. And look, only two weeks ago I was a mere corporal. The men relaxed, laughing at the oldest joke in the military. She lowered the cup. Now, I'm an Irish girl. We have fought in every war and under every banner. Today we fight again. Not for glory, although that's pretty cool. We fight because in the end, someone has too. Those savage killers currently overhead believe battle is glory. Mankind has learned otherwise. Life is glory enough. I will fight to keep us alive. Then I will fight to keep them, their twisted death cult, away from everyone else. So a toast to the fighting Irish. She swallowed the last of her coffee as the men cheered. Minehead, Week 12 Captain Hinckley, sir, they have found us. Her newly appointed comms officer had been waiting weeks for this. The engineers had sealed the mine and the enemy had wiped all traces of the buildings away. A landscape of rubble was all they could see on the last of their cameras. Then it went dark. Sergeant, I need to address the men. Begin sending the beacon. Tell these fuckers who we are. Time to remind the worlds who we are. She turned on her mic. Her face was gray with fatigue, her body thin from the diet of dwarf bread that she had eaten in front of the men for 40 days. Her mind strained from keeping a ray of hope for them all. She had kept them alive. Until today. Today. It ended. Today they died. But since it fell into my lot that I should rise and you should not, I'll gently rise and softly call good night and joy be to you all the Sejek battle fleet. Sire, the huntsmen have found them, many human life forms, deep underground. The battlemaster roared at the crew, triumphant. Finally! Days wasted on this, weeks, months. I knew they were hidden somewhere. Where? Begin the bombardment immediately. The crewmen bowed, sire. They are too deep for the ships to attack. We have already raised the planet. This is a matter best dealt with by the warriors. A crewman interrupted, sire, receiving an open transmission from the planet. It's on all bands. It will be heard by every spy satellite currently hiding in the system, and we have no idea what it means. The battlemaster snarled, forcing the crewman into submission. You said it was open! Break the code! The crewman, now flat on the ground, whined. Sire, there is no code. It's human music. A battle song, we think. So they know they are found and challenge us. All the better. Tell the fleet to cease fire and begin landing the men. I will lead the assault myself. Of all the money that e'er I had, I have spent it in good company. Oh, and all the harm I've ever done. Alas, it was to none but me, and all I've done for want of wit, to memory. Now I can't recall. Earth Defense Force A bewildered officer banged his way into Admiral Rourke's office. Sir, someone is broadcasting from the target. It just began. It's human, and it's on all bands, including our secure marine channels. The admiral looked up at the man with irritation. He had a low opinion of the officer anyway. He claimed to be Australian. Like that was possible. Now he was hearing ghosts. Well, what does it say? They were lost weeks ago. Sir, no one is sure. I brought a recording. It's on repeat. We have detected no humans on the planet since the Sijek counterattack. The admiral listened. He slowly turned gray, nearly as gray as Hinckley. He wasn't an old man. Not by modern standards, but he knew that song. He realized that this would haunt him for the rest of his life. He slumped back in his chair. Good night and joy be to you all, so fill to me the parting glass, and drink a health whate'er befalls. Then gently rise and softly call good night and joy be to you all. His staff officer was, if possible, more bewildered than he had been when he arrived. Sir, what does it mean? The admiral stared at him with older eyes. It means... It means we left them to die alone. He glanced at the screen. For 81 days. Alone. Tell the fleet we move now as we are. Tell them I don't give a shit about how ready they are. We are moving to attack right now. Then tell the entire Marine Battalion that is on its way to my office right now that we're going in. Of all the comrades that e'er I had, they're sorry for my going away. And all the sweethearts that e'er I had, they would wish me one more day to stay. The human fleets immediately began moving. Crew were left on planet, officers shouting as the loading bays were sealed by belligerent marines. The sense of some imminent emergency, some barely contained rage filled the ships. The marines refused to speak and senior officers simply said, 
Wait. Once in secure space, the Marine commander addressed the fleet. For those of you unfamiliar with me, I am the Marine commander. It is unusual for me to address the fleets, however the Admiral has permitted it today. Today we learned that our men are still on the target, that those we abandoned as dead still live. Today we will right a wrong. We will recover them, and we will reclaim our lost honor. I have asked the Admiral to let you hear their message to us. This is not a battle cry. This is a farewell. They cannot stand alone any longer, and so they call out to us, knowing that the enemy is above them, listening. We are answering that call. But since it fell into my lot that I should rise and you should not, I'll gently rise and softly call good night and joy be to you all, Admiral's flagship Earth Response Fleet. He addressed his assembled captains and commanders. Now we know why their battle fleet has been hanging around for months, sitting over a dead planet. You can rest assured that I have dealt with our intelligence office. You may pass the former staff cleaning the loading bays and toilets. All their theories that the enemy had made its point and might be willing to negotiate were exactly the bullshit we thought they were. They were hunting our people, the ones we decided were dead. We left them to be the sport of these psychopaths and fanatics. There are dues that need to be paid for our stupidity, and we are the ones going to pay it, willingly. Realistically, our people are dying down there. We will be arriving in a matter of hours, and I expect all of you to motivate your men to act accordingly. He looked to the Marine commander. I'm afraid I need you to ensure that the rage currently filling your men is used appropriately. It is unlikely anyone will be offering surrender anyway, but remind your men of the rules. That being said, go and get your people. If it's within my power, you shall have it. The battle plans have been released to your staff. Go to work, people. Minehead, Day 81 Hinkley addressed her men. She had wrestled with this since she had realized that no one was coming. She had never once told her troops except Sergeant Elysium, who was of the same opinion. Morning all, as you all know the day has come. It may be that our beacon will call the fleet here, but I doubt that will change much for us. We have rehearsed this. We will give them a proper Irish welcome and bleed these bastards dry. We have held them here for weeks. Our sacrifice has saved worlds and frustrated our enemies. Let them rage. Let them rush into our guns. Go to your positions and destroy these murderous scum. We might not live, but the price of our blood will be high. Let them remember this as their shame, that the fighting Irish turned their trap into a weapon against them. See you on the other side. The sea jack began landing. Without any available intel, Hinckley only had scraps of remembered reports shared with the sergeants. Maybe 6,000, maybe twice that. She had 600. She had lost some to accidents, some to despair, and some to injuries that proved too difficult to treat at the bottom of a hole. The sealed entrance was blown open. The traps laid outside had long been destroyed by the orbital bombardment. Inside was a different story. The Sijek entered unopposed, hundreds of troops crushed into the first cavern looking for glory. Nothing, not a human or trap to be found. The sappers blew an entrance to the second cavern and descended quickly. So fill to me the parting glass and drink a health whate'er befalls. Captain Hinckley watched as they swarmed about. Obviously, this species didn't have personal space issues, packing themselves tightly into both caverns as they searched for their prey. Surprise, motherfuckers! She blew the first floor and dropped it onto the troops on the second. Hundreds of tons of rock rained down on them, followed by the dead and dying. Her men emerged from hidden entrances and launched incendiary grenades. Then they left everything to burn and fell back. No way back now. Burning bridges was what the engineers called it. Hinckley had waited until the enemy was standing on them before setting the fire. Unfortunately, her scrappy intel was wrong. Over 20,000 troops had now landed on the planet. The Sejek fleet, driven by frustration, had moved closer to the planet. They released troops that had been held for invasions supposed to happen weeks ago. This would give the Pax a decisive win, a bit of exercise, and some useful propaganda. It wasn't helping the army organization, though. Everyone wanted to be first. Losing nearly a thousand troops in the first hour, without a single reported human death, send the battlemaster into a rage. Tell the packs to move back. Send in the huntsmen. No one else is to enter until we have a path. Execute whoever sent those orders. No one on his staff mentioned that it was him. 
Instead, they picked out personal rivals and ordered their deaths. Blood must follow failure. Of all the comrades that e'er I had, they're sorry for my going away. Minehead, Day 81 Hinkley watched as her enemies burned. She had bought some time and exacted a price. She remembered what Sergeant Elysium had said, never rely on an enemy to repeat a mistake, and had planned accordingly. Now it would be close quarters. If it was her out there, then special forces were next. This time the traps were small, well hidden and controlled by her own special forces, the ones who had designed every approach, every entrance. She listened and watched as they reported triggering them. The first huntsmen were met by small mines and well-concealed fire. The human doctrine of creating injuries to slow down the enemy didn't work. They simply shot the wounded and carried on. Even the worst human commander would have been embarrassed by the casualties. The Sejek were indifferent. They had plenty of men. Sniper fire riddled the enemy, but numbers matter. Despite losing few men, the humans were being pushed back. Once the Sejek had secured the entrance, the heavy ordnance began to arrive. The ESF arrived in the system. Unusually for the humans, they didn't attempt to contact the battle fleet for more tiresome diplomacy. The Sijak battle fleet moved slowly to face the new challenge. It was only humans, after all. Aside from the bait set for the trap, they had run as soon as they learned how big the battle fleet was. They had held the system for months without a human response to their victory. Presumably, it was simply their embarrassing lack of action that drove them in. In any case, now the fleet could claim its own victory. Minehead, Day 81 the Sijek were pushing through to level three. Despite horrendous losses in human terms, these assholes were winning. Hinkley made the call. Time to be nasty. These guys are on a suicide run. They need a target. Clear level four. Engineering, get ready for this, and I want everyone down to level five. Close the doors behind you, or I'll come back and kill your fucking ghost. This was a mine. When Hinkley had finally got around to wondering what they mined here, she got a pleasant surprise. This was a potassium mine. The auto refiners had left her with tons of the stuff sitting in oil-filled barrels. Bonfire night. So fill to me the parting glass and drink a health what e'er befalls, then gently rise and softly call. Sijek Ground Command The mood had lifted since the first attack. They had recovered as the huntsmen had pushed through the defenses. The numbers were irritating, but not important. They could call up more troops. The humans couldn't. Simple math said that this would be a victory. Sire, we have taken the third level. Humans have nowhere to go but down. We will have the next level shortly. They are falling back. The huntsmen report no remaining opposition. They are holding the entrance to level four. Excellent. Get the packs in. We will overwhelm them. No survivors. I want the human fleet to watch as these insects are destroyed. As down the glen one Easter morn to a city fair rode I, their armored lines of marching men in squadrons passed me by. No pipe did hum, no battle drum did sound its loud tattoo, but the Angelus bell or the Liffey's swell rang out in the foggy dew. Minehead, day 88, 1500 hours. Hinkley sealed her suit. She had managed to recharge and rearm most of it. Sergeant Ellison had solemnly brought various supplies from the medical bay. No one asked where they came from. They already knew. Do me a favor and change the damn music. We've been hearing that all day. Either they're coming or not. I have a better one. Her men were locking themselves into level six. Many had been fighting all day, and she had been trying to cycle them back into the canteen for food and warmth. The Sarge had produced unidentified pills and patches for them, allowing them a boost. I'll lose my license for this, but the boys need it, and I don't think we need worry about the long-term effects right now. Then he returned to his grim labor. She turned to the engineering sergeant. How much longer? You understand, none of us has a clue what will happen. I mean, this is something we were taught in school. Armies don't walk around with this stuff. Hinkley nodded. I remember it will burn, right? Mabry grimaced. Burn? There are tons here. It could take us all out, too. One hell of a bang is all I can tell you. The captain thought about pulling the men further back. But back where? The battlefield was only getting smaller, and that suited the enemy more than her. She turned to comms. Tell everyone to get to cover. Fuck knows what's about to happen. 
The men put their suits to maximum and got as close to the walls as possible, waiting. The barrels burst, the water mains blew. Suddenly, the sidejack on level four were soaking wet. Then the water hit the tons of potassium scattered by the barrels. The word exothermic sums up what happened. Liquid fire filled level four, pouring down into level five. Then the hydrogen caught fire. The explosion ripped through the ceiling, hurling huge blocks of stone through the air. All the Sedget troops were burned or flung by an explosion that ripped right to the surface, destroying all the enemies and repairs on the way. Level five just burned. Right proudly high over Dublin town, they hung out that flag of war. Twas better to die neath an Irish sky than at Suvla or Sudel Bar. And from the plains of Royal Meath, strong men came hurrying through, while Britannia's sons with their long-range guns sailed in from the foggy dew. When the walls stopped ringing, she called her men. Well, fuck me, that was a surprise. Get your men rotated down here. I don't think we'll be busy for a while. If the fires die out, I need you to retake level five. See if any of their heavy plasma weapons survived. Aye, Captain. You're not planning on doing that again, are you? Only the boys are all slightly deaf now. What? Can't hear you. I'm slightly deaf at the moment. Sijek ground command. The staff were stunned. No one had the faintest idea of what had just happened. The battlemaster had been directing operations from the first level, until he and all the attacking packs had been torn asunder by the explosion. The battle fleet was out in the system, hunting down the humans. Do we continue the attack? What are they using against us? Our intelligence showed that the human marines don't carry heavy weapons. It's counter to their doctrine. I am beginning to think that we know more about their doctrine than they do. Recall the packs. We must seek new leadership. The humans may have died in the explosion, too. In any case, post guards on the mine, the survivors aren't going anywhere anyway. Don't post them to close, just in case. Oh, the night fell black and the rifle's crack made perfidious Albion reel. Mid the leaded rail, seven tongues of flame did shine, or the lines of steel by each shining blade a prayer was said, that to Ireland her sons be true when the morning broke. Still, the war flag shook out its fold on the foggy dew. Sidjek battle fleet, attacking human fleet. The battle fleet took news of the battlemaster's demise remarkably well, since they had their own orders anyway. The general attitude was, well, if you fight on the dirt, don't expect much honor. However, they did send back a few ships to screen the planet. From the description of the explosion, it may have been an orbital attack, but that was seen as unlikely as far as the battle fleet was concerned. Still. It sidelined some unpopular captains that would now have to sit on the sidelines and watch the human ships burn. The communications officer looked up. Sire, the transmission from the humans has changed. We believe it to still be human battle music. The scum celebrate the death of our men. Commence the attack. They will change their tune shortly. Admiral's flagship Earth Response Fleet approaching Sigit Battle Fleet. Admiral Rourke looked at the report. So explain to me what happened. You report that a massive explosion destroyed the mine. The Sijek are withdrawing following massive losses, and you suspect that our Marines somehow carried a nuke around for weeks without first being issued one and second, not using it until now. Would you like to join your previous colleagues cleaning the toilets? His unlikely Australian staff officer squirmed. Sir, I meant that the scale was nuclear, not the weapon. Intel says they destroyed the Sajek leadership and an unknown but substantial number of ground forces died. They have also altered the transmission. I have brought you the new one. Perhaps you can identify it for us. The Admiral stiffened. He recalled the last one. He nodded. Play it. It was England bade our wild geese go that small nations might be free. Their lonely graves are by Suvla's waves on the fringe of the gray North Sea. But had they died by Pierce's side or fought with Cathal Brua, their graves we'd keep where the Fenians sleep, neath the shroud of the foggy dew. This time he smiled. The fuckers are still alive and fighting, bloody hell. That, officer I'm from Australia, is a proper battle song. I have no idea what they are doing, but they are still alive. Tell the Marines that there is still hope. Then assemble the captains. We will engage the enemy now. The staff officer went back to the bridge, muttering to himself, I keep telling him, Austria, not Australia. One mistake on one form. Fuck. Minehead, day 88, 
17.00. Most of the men had been fed and treated. The ones lost on level 5 had been recovered and the men were rebuilding the defenses. There was no one trying to kill them at the moment and they enjoyed the quiet. None of them had expected any kind of respite, and they had come to believe that the captain was born with the luck of the Irish. No one was quite sure what that was, except that if it killed their enemies and meant they had time to eat, today everyone was Irish. Hinckley called her sergeants to Vault 1. People, I didn't expect us to still be here. I believe we have defeated the ground troops for now, because guess who arrives next? Now that I blew a nice clean hole all the way down? Sergeant Elium was the first to respond. Fuck, the battle fleet can hit us now. Let's hope they're busy. Hinkley nodded. They may not have the idea yet, but I'm guessing they don't want to climb down to meet us again. I'd be looking for a couple of nukes from space if I were them. To put it as sweetly as possible, we need to get out. Now. The sergeants agreed after much muttering. So we climb? Aren't there any better ways to the surface? Not anymore. We have to go out through the breach. It's going to suck. I need our specials up on top before we evacuate. That is going to be bloody. I'm hoping you recovered some heavy plasma weapons. She looked at her armorer, who simply said, No, melted beyond use, sorry. We move light and fast. I'm taking the lead on this. Get your squads together. Best ones on the top and bottom, wounded last. Anyone with me needs the full stealth kit, steal it, borrow it, whatever. We leave in an hour. Sergeant Elysium goes with the wounded and is appointed second in command. Clear? Unhappy approval filled the room. EDF engaging the fleets engaged. The EDF fleets split into the small mobile units they preferred, while the Sijek formed large packs that looked to encircle and isolate the humans, always looking for the weak point. The capital ships were utterly different in concept and design. The humans had long since abandoned the dreadnought as a practical ship design, for the same reason that you don't salute officers in the field, unless you really didn't like them. Human ships shared a philosophy of thick-skinned, very mobile, and armed well, but not to the point of stupid. The Sijek were a pack mentality. Their capital ships were large, slow, and carried weapons that might be useful if the target was a large planet. However, they were surrounded by many, many smaller and sharper ships. The Sijek called them Claw Class. But the bravest fell, and the Requiem Bell rang mournfully and clear for those who died that Eastertide in the springing of the year. And the world did gaze in deep amaze at those fearless men and true who bore the fight that freedom's light might shine through the foggy dew. Admiral Rourke finished up. We are going to do the obvious. I want those capital ships dead. Punch through and use the new missiles. We are sending the Marines on a long path to land while we engage. They will be screened, but we need to wipe this fleet if they are to be safe. You all know your jobs. No quarter. We are not taking surrenders until we recover our people. I want the Sijic gone. Minehead, day 88, 18.00. Hinkley stood on level 5, the smell nearly unbearable. She had 60 men in full stealth gear. Look. Either they made it or it was some else's problem. She was just a corporal, at best a fresh sergeant. Definitely not responsible for all these lives. Shit, she couldn't even make herself believe it, let alone anyone else. Captain of Minehead it was. Maybe she'd get the pension. She turned to the men, her men. We need to hold the surface or everyone dies. On the other hand, none of us will ever need to eat dwarf bread again because, quite frankly, I'm quite prepared to eat the enemy at this stage. So keep it slow and steady. If you drop, I'm sorry, better hope they catch you because we only move up. Clear? The dark suits didn't exactly scream approval. In fact, without the HUD, she could barely see them. Perfect. Go! They swarmed up the broken rock, AI and old instincts powering them up the broken walls. Occasionally, one of them would punch in a secure point and move on. On her HUD, Hinkley could see the health of her people. This was nearly a kilometer climb after weeks of inactivity and a shit diet. She was worried more about the ones who knew what they were doing than the rank amateurs like her. Smug bastards. At least she had the benefit of sheer terror to keep her awake. And now she needed a piss. Fuck. 
then, back through that glen I rode again, and my heart with grief was sore, for I parted then with valiant men, whom I never shall see more, and back to and fro in dreams. I'll go and I'll kneel and pray for you, O oh, slavery fled, O oh, glorious dead, when you fell in the foggy dew. Minehead, day 88, 2300 hours. Sixty stealth-skinned soldiers moved up the walls. The engineers punching in secure points as they went, only useful if they could win to the surface. Hinkley was sweating despite her suit's best efforts. She hated heights. She hated anything that forced her to hang above the void. So far, the stealth gear seemed to be working, and that was really the only important thing. Her HUD said the first men would hit the surface in ten minutes. They could be dead in eleven if the sidejack were waiting. They were. Sijek Ground Command Sire, some humans have climbed up from the mine. We are engaging. Probably a few survivors. Send the guard packs to reinforce. Keep an eye on the situation. I'm waiting to hear from the fleet. I'm going to blast that death pit from orbit, and I don't want the troops nearby. The battle fleet aren't known for their accuracy. Just contain it. Hinkley swore as she watched the life signs blink out as the men reached the top. All squads, assemble below the breach. Keep your fucking heads down. I don't need any more heroic corpses. I need fucking soldiers. Now get your shit together. On me, ASAP. She then promptly ignored her own orders and climbed over the top. She released her drone, trying to find the enemy line. She didn't need to wait, since the sijack then immediately shot her in the face. Her head was still ringing as she dropped back. Son of a bitch, that hurts. Her helmet had taken most of the damage, but her HUD was fucked. She waited on the north face of the breach, just below the surface. The wall had broken enough to form a useful ledge. At least she didn't have to look down and could rest her back. Her face was stinging like a bastard. Fuck climbing. People did this for fun? It took nearly 40 minutes to assemble the men. She had ordered them to rest. Time was ticking away. This was a one-shot deal. Either they made it and lived, or everyone was dead. As above, so below. She remembered that phrase from some bitch selling magic oils or something. If they didn't hold the surface, if she failed, nukes were going to fall and everyone below died. Sergeant Elysium would haunt her ghost if his patients were hurt. All right, lads, we know they can see us. We know what happens if we fail. The plan is simple. We move as one, punch north, killing anything that tries to stop us. Then we capture their heavy weapons, reform and attack their positions from the other side. I'm sending you the best plan I can create since they leveled the place. I'll put up more drones as soon as we are clear. Fix bayonets, people, and be ready to use them. The Sijek troops guarding the mine were spending a lot of time looking at the sky. Knowing that the battle fleet was going to bomb the place had created a certain unhappiness. The couple of humans that had crawled out had been swiftly dealt with. Some of the lower-level packs had vanished into the distance, looking for prey on a planet they had spent weeks blowing up. Still, technically allowed. Bastards. Hinkley and her men erupted over the ledge, running as only humans would, straight into heavy fire. Stumbling over broken ground and leaping craters as they went, they advanced. The sijack on the north were stretched. Aside from one or two humans earlier, they were more preoccupied with the battle fleet. They focused quickly when the sentries died. This raging wave of attackers were nearly invisible, save for the glow of the weapons. The Sijek hadn't used bayonets for at least the last thousand years. They didn't have a shotgun setting either. It wasn't yet a massacre. Human bodies littered the field. When the raging shadows that were the human troops hit the Sijek line, blades at the ready, then it became a massacre. Hinkley stabbed down, slicing some poor bastard right through the gut. Get those guns pointed at those bastards south. Pick up the heavy plasma, fuck the rest, move. Her squads moved through the Sijek line, a cloud of desperate men defending the new hope they held, that they guarded for their comrades still in the mine. The Sijek fought on, outflanked and facing weapons and tactics not seen since the blood wars, but they died, and they died hard. ERF began firing into the Sijek battle fleet. The humans turned and twisted their way through space. Each captain had chosen a target and a route, and given the stakes, they weren't about to lose. The problem is how fucking big space is. 
You can't surprise anyone, so the humans didn't bother. They began a mad dance designed to minimize contact with the claw ships. The claw ships tried. Powerful guns were turned on mankind. Brave pilots engaged, inflicting glorious damage and sacred death. Still they came. Unwilling to die, the humans corkscrewed through space, refusing death until cornered. Then the sea jack learned why cornering humans was a bad idea. They came back screaming and murderous, dismissing death as unimportant, dying only at the highest cost. The claw ships didn't understand the doctrine or the tactics. This was not how hunted prey should behave. They behaved like a mother defending cubs, not warriors in battle. The admiral watched as the battle progressed. Other than initial orders, there was nothing more he could do. He would fight his own ship and pray the others did the same. Launch the fighters. Then the capital ships started to fall. Unseen missiles slammed into the slow-moving battle fleet capital ships and shattered their command and control. The instinct to protect the failing capital ships brought the claws in close, where they suffered the same fate. The explosions lit up space. The Sijek watched as their best, the finest weapons the galaxy had ever seen began to fall to the humans. Emboldened observers began to believe that Pax Humanitas was real. Plans began to be laid. To be rid of these pack hunters was a blessing long awaited, and here was a species willing and able to engage and defeat them. Now every human was a superhero, every ship a battleship. It annoyed the fuck out of humans just out for a walk or trying to park a cargo ship. It took 15 hours before the Sijek fleet was completely destroyed. The ERF had lost 30% of their forces. The Admiral looked at the maps. If they had fought properly, we would have had our asses kicked. Look at the numbers. A lesson for us all. Also, as we have been told since Eve stole an apple, never reinforce failure. Congratulations to all. Move to the planet as soon as you recover your pilots. This isn't over. Hinkley regrouped her men. They had taken half the line. One more push and the surface was secure. A swift headcount gave her 40 men ready and able. She tried to crush her emotions when a third of her men didn't respond. Check the dead. We need the big guns. We move west. Keep your bayonets on. Remember, we need to push them out or everyone dies. Finally, her men had some decent heavy weapons. They poured on suppression fire, chewing up the ground as her men moved up. The last Sijek abandoned their posts under the assault. They had seen blades rip into the pack, shadows attacking from all directions, their own positions turned against them. These humans were a curse. They broke and ran for cover. Let the battle fleet deal with them. The fighting continued, now reduced to sniper fire. The Sijek weren't cowards, just demoralized and lacking any kind of leadership. The fighting Irish were brought to the surface under fire, but still they made the surface. Sergeant Elysium was the last up. Captain Hinckley was sitting on the edge, swinging her feet over the breach, waiting for him. The sergeant saw the blood and battle damage. Hinckley looked like death was having a quiet sit down. Christ. I see you made us all at home. Death, fire, and injured. Where am I working? Hinckley pointed. Over there, quick as you can, sergeant. Might I add that I need a little treatment myself? Of course, captain. Did you stub your toe on the way up? Hinckley pulled off her helmet. Her face was completely burned by the plasma bolt she had caught on the way off the cliff. The burns had bitten deep. It would take months to repair, if it could be repaired at all. Sergeant Elysium kept his voice steady. Of course, Captain, I'm sure I have a cream for that. When Intel finally reached the Sijek ships in orbit about the loss of the battle fleet, those sent to screen the planet began to land and recover the troops that had survived and fled before the humans arrived. She watched through the drones as the sea jack left. Get the men moving. I found us a nice house with a view. Hopefully they left the kitchen behind. Since Hinckley wasn't looking for another battle, she watched them leave, then she stole their barracks. The sea jack ate the same miserable rations that were issued to every army in the galaxy. Food of the gods after dwarf bread. Sergeant, I'm going to sleep. Call me up if God herself or an admiral turns up, otherwise deal with it. The Marine commander landed, his men rushing to cover him as he left the ship. A single trooper approached, name and rank? The commander nearly bit his tongue. What? Sorry, sir, I can't let you pass until I have name and rank. Captain's orders. 
The commander lowered his voice in sympathy with an idiot. You don't have a captain. I'm the Marine commander. Your commander. I'd know. The trooper made a call. Tell the Sarge. He's been waiting for this. No, let her sleep. Sergeant Elysium appeared from nowhere. Evening, commander. I'm here to stop you fucking up. Suddenly, the largest man he had ever seen was in front of him. The commander's guards started to raise their guns. He waved them down. He saw the stripes and the medical armband. Explain yourself, Sergeant. Hinkley is our captain, and we don't need you to rescue us. Did you notice how no one was trying to kill you on your way in? We killed them, or they ran away. This little shit show of yours, that's how it works, right? When we were broken and hiding in the dark, we needed you. Six weeks ago? Great. Now? After we killed them all? The general attitude is go fuck yourself. The Marine commander made to interrupt. I'm sorry, what? The sergeant wasn't going to stop. Weeks of dead and wounded had brought his patience to an end. So don't tell us we don't have a captain and don't think turning up for the after party means anything to us. You can help us bury the dead and shut the fuck up. And when you meet her, you will respect her rank. Is that clear, sir? EDF, orbiting former Homner Mine. Earth was unhappy. Instead of rescuing the deeply grateful survivors of the Sijek attack, they were met with a sullen, victorious troop of Marines. Some self-appointed captain was dictating the terms of the engagement. She had contacted the media herself and told the galaxy that the glorious rescue was too little, too late. How her men had saved themselves after months of isolation. How Earth had forgotten them. She was loved by the world and backed by a fiercely loyal bunch of men. Corporal Hinckley needed to be sent quietly out of the way. The Admiral was standing as she arrived, the best of humanity and the worst of heroes. This was a eulogy, as he buried her career while praising her actions. I can now confirm the commission given to you in combat. You are granted the rank of captain. In recognition of your heroic efforts, you are charged with the formation and command of the 81st Irish. This will consist of those that you brought back to us from death. He stood back and saluted as the badges of rank and the medals for valor were pinned on. It took a while. He made a note that 81st would be on the cutting edge of the attack on the Sijek homeworld.